With a BA in studio art, Scholl has studied sculpture, printmaking and various painting media. His current body of work contains a diversity of styles and motifs and often focuses on the figure, personal explorations of identity and the creation of representation of queer people in places of fine art. Using his work to fill in the gap of what he still finds himself looking for in museums or galleries, he has shaped his portfolio and his purpose as an artist. Over to you, William. Right. All right, so thank you. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes, I'm not muted. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm William Scholl. Um, as was said, I am a multimedia artist, so I do a lot of different mediums, uh, printmaking, painting, sculpture, drawing. I do uh, stuff with film as well, but I haven't included any of that in this presentation, so no need to worry about flashing images. Um, that will not occur. And just to start, um, is if the slideshow will let me interact with it, that would be wonderful. There we go, all right. So to start, I have some pages from my sketchbooks because I figured that was a great way to start um, just a discussion on my artistic process. I have a sketchbook with me wherever I go. Um, I have learned how to do book binding so I can make my own sketchbook out of whatever sort of paper or materials that I want to work with. So um, the oil painting is a sketch in a sketchbook made out of canvases so that I could use it underwater or I could um, use it in other places where paper wouldn't hold up. And also just so that I could use oils in a sketchbook setting and do um, sketches in the field with palette knife. Um, the page next to it is done on a paper sketchbook and I've collected a leaf because I, as I collect sketches, I collect other things from the environment and all of it later plays a role into when I'm doing finished pieces. Um, and that drawing, which we'll go back to later, is done with a stick that I found in that environment, carved and then used with ink. So from a completely different point, moving away from the sketches that are landscaped and environment based, um, this painting, which was done in 2018, is more portraiture based, which is something that is a very recurring theme in my art. A lot of my artwork focuses on the figure, specifically the face, and hands are also often used to um, elevate the gesture, the expression, and to sort of guide uh, the eye through the composition of the piece. This work um, also uses text. However, the text of this piece is not meant to um, add to the understanding of it or even add like a written element, it's being used the same way as brush strokes to add more line work to the piece, which is why um, many of the letters are purposefully um, stamped on in a way to make it difficult to decipher them, whether that is because too much paint was applied to them or not enough, or they were stamped on the same space multiple times. Um, and another reason that I included this piece is because it's also a piece that uses a lot of personal symbolism. So there are things in this piece that mean something to me, and it won't mean the same thing to the average viewer of the piece unless they come and ask me to tell them the story about why I decided to use these colors or those words or even that face. And I use a lot of personal symbolism in my work. And I'll talk more about that again later and sort of how it's developed. But I think it is important to emphasize that it is still um, valuable to create artwork that is centered on the self and one's own experiences and one's own ideas and imagery. Because a lot of the times there's this idea that you have to create something that people are asking for or that people can easily consume or that people can understand. And just because someone doesn't know the person I depicted or why I use those colors or words doesn't mean they can't bring their own experiences to understanding this piece. Um, but I'd now like to continue to talk about the use of gesture because another one of uh, the themes that I explore in my work is sort of love, especially when I'm using uh, the figure. And here again, this also shows the use of hands to sort of guide the viewer through the piece and unite um, the two faces in this sort of loving embrace-like situation, despite the fact that it is quite literally disembodied heads. That's not something that's really evident, it's just, really the abstraction of the piece. This work also starts to introduce some elements that 
come up again and again, which is that of like floral and plant motifs. And you can see one of the figures is wearing a crown of laurels, which has been used throughout art history um, to represent victory, particularly in works from antiquity and Roman and Greek works. So I like to use laurels a lot um, and that crown, but sort of reinterpret it as just sort of a symbol of something good or that something that is a goal to achieve. So instead of victory in a more classical sense, it's just working as almost a non-religious halo as a way to say what this figure is doing is something that is good, something that is virtuous or victorious. And because this is a painting titled The Lovers, which shows two people um, in this peaceful and close embrace, then it is a more gentle take on the victory wreath. This is another piece which continues with that theme of the hands, the embrace, the framing. However, this also introduces another common theme of my works, which is queer representation and queer love. This piece was originally painted in 2015 as part of a project I was working at, on at the time called the Untitled Project, uh, when I would paint queer individuals or couples in a celebratory way but I would title the pieces after individuals uh, who were homophobic or transphobic. And these weren't famous people. These were people who either myself, the subjects of the painting or other people who did not want to be included in the paintings um, relayed the names to me. So these are everyday people. And the purpose of that project was to highlight at the same time, the beauty of the queer community and the struggles faced by people every day, not just when you're talking about famous people who are an example of the struggles we take face, but literally just the everyday issues and why we need to keep fighting for an education and acceptance to be taught to everyone. Um, I repainted this and gave it just its own title. She married her in 2018 because I was doing a solo show, uh, which was created by my local art society, which had a setup to allow artists to do uh, solo exhibits in different local businesses. And I um, titled, so she married her was always part of the title. It just had the person's name first and then she married her. I used subtitles for all of the pieces in the Untitled Project because I wanted to avoid malicious reinterpretation, which is a special word I use for when I paint queer people and uh, cisgender heterosexual people say, I don't see it that way. I think that's a painting of a man and a woman, which, to be fair, it is impossible to know someone's gender from looking at them. That is something you can only get from talking to them about it. Um, but the subtitles for all my pieces, one another one had its name and then was called Two Boys Kissing. And this one, its subtitle was She Married Her, make it very clear that the situation is queer. And it is the titles that tell you the genders of the figures or even sometimes just the pronouns of the figures being depicted. Um, so this title, was remained when it when I brought the piece out of the Untitled Project and repainted it as its own standalone thing. Um, she Married Her was one of the many of the first pieces that when they were put into the show, um, they were hung up with people at that business who saw their cue cards, who attached the cue cards to the pieces. Two days after the show opened, I was called by the Art Society and informed that without my knowledge or consent, several of the pieces had been removed. And this was one of them, along with every other piece that involved queer themes. When I went there to discuss this, they claimed that they thought this is a painting of a man and a woman, as they claimed that with all of the other queer pieces that they could not tell that they were queer. And I reminded them that we'd hung up the cue cards together and that they knew the title of all those pieces, at which point they did admit they did know that these were queer paintings. Um, but they thought that this painting in particular was too dark. One of them called it the kiss of death. So I fought for these paintings to be reinstalled and they were. As a consequence, they removed um, all advertising for the like open gallery night that was supposed to happen and it just didn't occur. Um, it was a very bad experience. However, this painting has made a comeback. It is currently in the uh, one exhibit at Round Lemon and it, so that was really important because now it's back and it's in a space for art. Um, also, immediately after that show ended that it was meant to be in, it was purchased by a uh, queer health center in my community, 
which is where I started receiving my hormone treatment. So it's a place that is very important to me specifically, but also as an artist, um, my goal, of course, is to have my work in galleries and museums. But I think in this specific instance, this is the best possible place for some of the work that I make to be, because I've been to that clinic many times. And I know also from experience that the people who go there, they don't always go with support and they don't always go knowing if they will have support when they walk out. So this painting was purchased, it now belongs to them. It is the first thing that anyone who walks into the clinic will see, which I think is both important for the people who go there without any support and the people who go there with support or with hesitant support to see this normalization and above normalization, a celebration of queer identities. And this is a painting of uh, a transgender lesbian couple getting married as the original was painted in 2015. It was meant to um, celebrate the marriage, but also specifically included trans individuals as a reminder that we are far from over um, with the fight for uh, fair treatment. So on the subject of rejected artwork, I did want to briefly talk about this sculpture that never happened. So this, the project for this was to create a sculpture that changed the form of the body. And as a trans artist, I immediately had a very clear concept of what I wanted to do. So this artwork was meant to discuss um, two different things. At that point, I was using binding a lot, and this was supposed to also dis discuss how when you are able to present yourself in a certain way using binding or a similar method, it allows you to present yourself as you want to be presented is very important and it can be life-saving, but it is also time, there's a time constraint on it. So at this point in my life, I could pick eight hours in which I presented as I wanted to, or less. I, you should not wear a binder for more than eight hours. So this piece is a plaster breastplate um, designed based off of statues from antiquity that worked with the idealized male form. It was meant to be a heavy blast plate with a wire skeleton, and it would be worn by someone by wrapping the wires in the back, as just shown in one of the drawings. And because of the weight imbalance of the heavy plaster on one side held in place by wires, as time went on, this would wear into the person who was wearing it and cause physical discomfort and eventually need to be removed. And that, that time constraint of wearing the piece was supposed to discuss the frustration I had at getting to choose a limited amount of hours a day. Uh, another thing that this piece was meant to discuss was sort of the impossible above impossible standards that trans binary people are held up to in order to be respect respected as their gender. So if a trans woman is to be respected as a woman, she has to look better and more feminine than all the cis women around her. If a trans man is to be respected as a man, he needs to be more masculine than all the trans men around him because it isn't enough to just meet the low standards. They have to go above and beyond. And that was the use of the idealized male form here. Unfortunately, this piece did not happen because it was immediately rejected. I was told the reason it was rejected was because it dealt with trans um, subjects and that trans art was not to be tolerated because it was not something people wanted to see. Instead, I created a wearable bean bag, which can be seen in the April Fish exhibit around London. Um, immediately after that, the next project I did was continuing to work with the theme of statues from antiquity, but inspired by the work of Igor Mitaraj, who makes these monumental um, sculptures that evoke uh, statues from the past but they use these geometric shapes that interact with the organic fragmentation of the works. And so what I wanted to do was I wanted to make miniatures off of this theme. And here are two of those. But then as I continued with the project, because I had just been had this project rejected, I specifically made this project about trans experiences, gender affirming, gender affirming surgeries and my relationship as a trans masculine person with my body is a very easy narrative to have when you're already working with fragmented statues, because as a trans person in a museum, especially in art history museum, oftentimes the closest thing to representation you are going to get is in a statue that has been broken in just the right way. And I know where all of these statues are, the art history museums I have frequented. <laughs> but I used this uh, opportunity to create a work that focused on these themes. 
And if you'll see, there are several pieces in which it is more obvious than others. But um, in the piece with the, the bust with the cubic head, you can see exactly where the bust cuts off, sort of a reference to top surgery. But also the cubic head is a literal box and there is a lid to that box. You can see the lid is placed directly next to the hand sculpture that is like that. And there's some um, lettering on the lid that has been sort of washed over, which is very referential to when we look at things from the past or things from ancient Rome, how the letters have been over time eroded just by wind or people walking on them if it's something on the ground. And the lettering that is actually in that piece is the phone number I called to schedule my top surgery because I called them on a break from working on this sculpture. And after I called them and I used that number and wrote it down, I washed over it so that nobody can pick up this piece and also call them because that would probably be annoying to them. Um, but there are other hidden things when you see the torso with the parts cut out of it and how one of the cuts in the chest over where the breast would be, if you hold the piece and look closely, um, you can see a wing, a gilded wing. There are other aspects of these pieces that um, also, sorry, I can't see because of, oh yes, there's the small torso that is being held by two hands. And on that one, there are literal lines from top surgery carved into the torso. So that is something that was very much on my mind when I was working on these. It was something I had wanted to explore in artwork but hadn't been allowed to. And so I was doing it now in a secret way. And one of the reasons that I bring up this piece, as I mentioned earlier with the um, first painting that I talked about, is that there is this um, continuing theme of personal symbolism in my artwork. And this is one of the places where that started because I wasn't doing it on purpose. It wasn't a purposeful thing to have these hidden symbols and messages. But in order to explore the themes I wanted to explore, it needed to be done in a way where I knew what I was looking at and I knew what I was seeing. But the people who were working with me did not. And that is something that I've continued to use in pieces as I create pieces that are meant to have purposefully two different responses from two different audiences, where one is supposed to get it and the other is kind of just supposed to see some nice artwork and maybe take something else from it. And then I graduated and I was no longer working with those people. And I created this. Um, and this is the complete opposite of those. This painting in every way. So these sculptures were very small, like handheld, very tiny little things. This painting is six feet tall and four feet wide. It is a very big painting. It is entirely done in oils with some acrylic for the gold leaf effect. And it is called Renaissance, Renaissance and was meant to take on sort of two senses of the words where the idea of this painting is to show trans self-acceptance as a Renaissance, as a rebirth, as something divine, as something to be celebrated in something, instead of something to be condemned. So the idea that realizing you are trans, understanding you are trans is this beautiful moment that is here deified with appropriated religious imagery. Um, and a lot of the inspiration from my art comes from historic artwork and also the fact that growing up, I was exposed to a lot of medieval art, a lot of Roman and Etruscan art, Byzantine art. And so some of those symbols have carried over now where they don't have the same meaning. They're just aesthetics that I saw over and over again. And now I'm reappropriating in my own way. And here I have that filled in halo, which is similar to the filled in halo seen here, which is used oops, to give sort of a solar effect to the person beneath it. And here it's just to say, similar to the crown of laurels, that what is happening, sorry, my arrows are being weird, was happening is something that is good, something to be celebrated. And there are a lot of other very blatant symbols. The chest is completely exposed. Um, there's a huge amount of flowers and florals are something that I use a lot because they're so easy to manipulate to symbolism. And here they're in the colors of the trans flag. Also the thigh is exposed. And for me, I do injections for my hormone treatment. So I inject testosterone into my thigh weekly. And so if you go up to this painting with a magnifying glass, there are the tiniest little print pricks with um, a paintbrush to show that, but you don't really need the pre pin pricks because the exposed thigh is enough for those who understand there is a reason that that is there um, in, in this painting, which 
is focused on accepting one's own identity and celebrating it in that moment. But it was also a renaissance for my artwork because now I was at this point where I was sort of frustrated with the lack of representation in the art styles that I grew up seeing. I had already been frustrated with not being allowed to or being told there was no place for this sort of work in fine art. And I was also at this point where I could really just paint wherever, whatever I wanted. And since my work has expanded from this point onward, I used a lot of these symbolisms and these aspects of imagery again and again and again in my work. And so here's another one where you can see there's the use of florals, there's the use of the top surgery scars. Um, this piece, First Ophelia, Last Horatio, or sorry, Last Ophelia, First Horatio, I always do that, um, was a, sort of just a play on my own works. So again, sort of that personal um, symbolism, but um, in 2016, I was focused primarily in printmaking. And I created this piece, Ophelia regarding Gertrude, which was meant to take the suicide of Ophelia, which is often used by artists due to the fact that it is this aesthetically pleasing moment, which is slightly problematic, but Shakespeare really did make it a beautiful death. She's floating, she's surrounded by flowers. She's described as being mermaid-like, completely unaware of her peril until she is very slowly, slowly dragged down by the weight of her clothes. I wanted to take that and give Ophelia more agency and also make it about the accountability because um, in Hamlet, Ophelia goes through a lot. Uh, her love interest murders her father and she sort of whine, it sort of just breaks away at her mental health. Nobody really supports her through this. Uh, her boyfriend becomes quite emotionally abusive or which is Hamlet, her love interest who had just murdered her father and things get worse and worse and worse for her but nobody ever makes an active effort to assist her at any point, they purposefully ignore it. So she starts to act a bit out of place, um, reciting poetry, walking around in night clothes, giving people flowers and people just sort of let her do it and ignore it. And this accumulates into her death where it happens off stage and Gertrude comes back and describes the fact that she fell in the water and she spent a long time floating there until finally her clothes dragged her down. So this, was reinterpreting that scene as having Ophelia staring at the viewer as if they are Gertrude and she is holding them accountable for her demise, for the lack of help, uh, for the lack of emotional support and the lack of care for her mental illness and also for the fact that Gertrude really did just watch her very slowly drown. Um, and then on the far end of the slide, there's Ophelia 3.0 because I worked with the theme of Ophelia a lot. I drew her many different times. These are just two of the ones that I still have nice photos of. Uh, what I really like about Ophelia 3.0 though is that I was working with um, intaglio prints at the time, so I would get a copper plate and I would etch into it. And so for this one, I really let the plate that I got, I could have cut it down into a smaller form, but I got this incredibly long, narrow plate and I really wanted to just see what I could do with that shape which led to her sort of crawling out of the water on these skulls, um, sort of like coming back out of the depths instead of passively drowning. So I really enjoyed um, very completely ignoring and disregarding the canon of Shakespeare's work and just using this character to explore different themes. And so then in 2019, I uh, reinterpreted this further, but this is really just sort of a play at myself and my own artworks because I had used Ophelia so much um, for my art and as, as a motif that now I was sort of reflecting on how transitioning had affected my own mental health and my own personal situation. So there's Ophelia in the water tearing out hair and then it's a diptych, so it's two separate pieces, but right next to that is Horatio. And for those of you who are not as familiar with this play as I am, which is, I did a lot of art about it, so I'm a little bit familiar. Um, Horatio is the one named main character who survives the play. So he's here being used as a symbol of survival and also the ability to thrive and how important it is for trans people to be able to accept themselves and to live as their own lives in order to survive. And also how in these years, um, the character who I most identified with went from being Ophelia, the character who I was most easily able to identify with, who I wanted to work through, who I wanted to use in my works, uh, to being Horatio, the one who survives the play and the one who's a little bit gay for Hamlet. So here I have them together showing that juxtaposition and also 
creating a new narrative in which Ophelia is trans, rips out her hair, and survives as Horatio. William Shakespeare would hate me, but there it is. Um, and I really liked printmaking for some of the reasons that I already mentioned, um, but it is not something I have access to because I no longer can use a printing press. I don't have acid. I don't have large sheets of copper. So what I'm doing now is I've started to use digital art, which is something I was very wary to use because I'm very tactile when it comes to my art, which is part of the reason why printmaking was so attractive to me because you, you work with these pieces, you have the copper, you clean it, you treat it, you etch it, and then you treat it again, and then you leave it in acid, and then you treat it again. And it's this whole like almost therapeutic process. Um, but I found that I can get more invested in digital art and appreciate it when I'm treating it the same way I would in a type of print where I just act like I am etching. So here I have two different prints that show sort of uh, my investigations in the natural world. And then the digital artwork, Mothman, uh, which was directly inspired by works that I had done on my insect print, which allows me to continue pretending I'm able to use a printing press just by using my computer. And so I had to include this one, which I did in the exact same way, just pretending that I was making an Italio print. And of course, this is used to advertise this talk, so I had to throw it in here. And it's also a great jumping point to talk about sort of using digital artwork the way one would printmaking, and also using um, commonly used motifs, stories, myths, and the things that we see again and again used by artists in my own work. So this is David with the head of Goliath. Um, and this is a direct reference to Caravaggio's piece of David with the head of Goliath, which looks very similar to this. And I really love Caravaggio's work. Um, he depicts masculinity in a very feminine way and in a very attainable way um, that for me, even before hormone treatment and even before really understanding what my gender was, these seemed attainable and also like, desire, something that one would desire to emulate when I would see his depictions of masculinity. And even this is especially clear in David, who's a youth, so he's got this very nebulous jawline, it's hardly there, the small shoulders. He doesn't look um, the way Michelangelo's sculpture of David looks. This is, this is much more achievable. And so it was very easy for me to sort of project onto this painting when there were no others for me to try and relate to. So here I've given him a very clear and obvious top surgery scar. Um, and I've also continued to work on this in different styles. And so this is another David with the head of Goliath, which I've done. And um, I had a lot of fun with the style of this one. If you look at it closely, like the way the hand is holding the head, the way the hand can in no way belong to his shoulder. Um, he still has a very stoic expression and the blood spurts from this head, even though it's a very different style, they're still inspired by Caravaggio's works because I really love the way he paints blood spurts, which sounds odd, but he has this very delicate, romanticized, ephemeral way of depicting individuals. And then the way he depicts blood spurts is very also dramatic, but almost cartoonish. And it's the same on his shield with Medusa where there's just these jagged, like intense red blood spurts coming away from this very like carefully depicted screaming face. So I did the gesture there to pay homage to that. And another myth that I really like to explore is that of Icarus. Icarus is someone who I saw a lot in different works throughout art history, but also um, in etchings and engravings by different artists who take inspiration from this myth. And it's a very attractive myth, similar to the way that Ophelia is attractive with all of her flowers. This is a myth of a man with wings and feathers falling from the sky. So it's already something that seems beautiful. Um, but in mine, I like to make him okay, um, which is not the way the story goes. And I just think it would be nice if he was fine and that sometimes we need a little bit of hubris and coming from the queer community where oftentimes it takes a lot of hubris to exist loudly and in public and openly and and in a way that also expresses uh, self-love and and without doubt that that takes hubris so I think that maybe sometimes it should not go punished and um, another myth in which I have taken the vice and made it more virtuous is that of Narcissus, where I like to reinterpret 
his vanity as instead self-love or an explicitly trans term, gender euphoria. Um, and I have a workshop about this, so I won't go too much about it here. But here are two pieces of exploring, which I call narcissists, because I take the cis out. So here are two different pieces. And in one of them, you can see I use again that sort of Byzantine halo of that full circle to show like what I am depicting here is not a vice. And then in the other is an oil painting that I've drawn over digitally. And you can really see that the flowers here kind of um, are very, very similar to the ones in Ophelia, where it's just like a million of these little flowers drawn the same way. And then I have the oil painting here, which I am still working on. I have, a, I have more flowers to add to it, um, but this will be entirely done in oils. And then I'll have the trifecta, so. Um, and on the topic of flowers and the overuse of flowers, um, this was uh, the final statue that I did when I still had access to materials to make massive statues. She's over six feet tall. Um, so the best way for me to show the different aspects of her was through this collage, because otherwise you really have to be in person to kind of like look at what's going on. A uh, picture that captures her whole stance doesn't get anything else. But this is a reinterpretation of the myth of Daphne and Apollo, and this is called Daphne coming out as asexual, and it's a representation of uh, asexuality, which is one of the queer identities in which one does not experience sexual attraction to any gender. Um, and I felt that the myth of Daphne and Apollo was very easily used for this because Daphne is being pursued by Apollo, she is not interested, she prays to not have to deal with him, and she is transformed into a tree. And I wanted to take that and instead of depicting it as a tragedy of her turning into a tree, sort of, sort of show her growing from this uh, identity and, and having a sort of freedom from it and also more life from being turned into a tree. So the white of this is sort of um, meant to evoke that of a marble statue and then color was painted into the plant life to show the transformation of a plant as something giving life, providing life to this cold marble statue. And she's also shown with a joyful expression. All of the models uh, and uh, people who helped me with this piece were uh, people who at the time identified as asexual. And the main model for this piece was a trans woman who at the time identified as asexual and then continued to do more modeling for artists. Um, so Daphne turns into a laurel tree. And already I've talked about how I like to use laurel crowns, but after creating Daphne, they also became a way for me to celebrate identity because again, it's that whole use of personal symbolism. I've used this before when talking about how one grows from their identity and accepting themselves. So now I'm using it again and again and again. Um, and I also just really like drawing leaves. And that's something that you can see in a lot of my works is that the figure and the environment, especially when it's a natural environment, sort of blur into each other. And it's not quite clear where the figure ends and the plants or the natural environment begins. Oh, right. well, there we go. So yeah, I have this here just because I took all these pictures of leaves. I really like leaves now. Um, so as I continue to draw works that explore people in the environments and people as a part of the ecosystem, I've I still use flowers a lot as I am doing for Narcissus since I did for Ophelia, but also leaves have now become more and more and more present as I just have become more invested in forests, I've spent more time in them. I really like green now, I really like leaves, and that is directly impacting my works as I create more works where there are no flowers, it's just leaves. And these still are sort of celebrating the figures that are within them. And um, here we have again that piece of the sketchbook, which I drew from a stick taken from the environment, which then I carved to draw the environment. And the figure is very much just a part of the environment. There's nothing that sets them apart, even though they don't blend into it as smoothly as some of the others. I've included these because another um, thing that I use a lot in my artwork is the ocean. I grew up by the sound. So these are pictures near from where I grew up. Um, I used an underwater camera to take these that is broken in a very specific way where it will write the incorrect date on the photo. These were not taken in 2009. I don't know when they were taken, but not then. <laughs> but I wanted to take, I use these pictures in particular because they show some of the colors and motifs that I use in my work. So this one, um, which I painted this year, again, you can see some of the colors that I picked 
based off of what I see and what I associate with the ocean, those ochres from the kelps and then the grays and the blues. But I also really like using a looser line. And again, here, similar to the one with the leaves, the figure and the environment are not defined as being separate from each other. I also find when I am doing works about trans identity that the ocean is something that comes up again and again and again. And the ocean is something that both protects and obscures uh, the form and the human body while also exposing the form. So going to a place like a beach or the ocean is something that can be affirming and endangering in the exact same time, which leads to a very complicated relationship. And as I grew up, spending a lot of time in the water, then there's another layer of complication to this relationship, um, which I explore a lot in my work. And this is, I think this is my favorite piece. Um, this is Homecoming and you can buy it at the Round Lemon shop. I would, if I were you. Um, it's my favorite piece though. I have it hanging up behind me. And it's a multimedia piece. So it uses uh, pretty much every paint media that I had on me. Um, it's first I drew the figure in a rose ink and then I went over that in a sepia ink and then I added acrylic and then I added this very thick oil with a palette knife to show the texture of the wave. So it's a very texturally rich piece, but it also has that delicate gesture, which is again guided by the figure's face and the hand um, to evoke this emotion that I don't have the words for. So I painted this picture. And now I'm going to talk about material for a bit really quickly using this. Um, so something that I uh, focused on a lot when I was studying artwork was how we can choose a material that changes the meaning of the work. So this is a great example because this is a protest poster. It was made to be carried in protest. So it was made off of what I had on me at the time. But even while I was painting it, that added to the artwork, the texture of cardboard, the texture of the cardboard where it was ripped. And it also puts it in contact with the purpose of this piece. This piece was meant to be something easily made, not meant to live forever, just meant to be used to share a message as every other poster made on cardboard was meant to at that event that I made this for. And this is another one that is the same thing. The material used in the piece is what gives the piece its meaning in this case entirely. So this was the first sculpture that I ever made. And also the reason I started doing sculpture is because I wanted to do a piece that talked about the bioaccumulation of pollutants and plastics in large marine mammals. Um, and I knew that a painting of a whale filled with trash would not have the same impact or meaning as a whale skeleton uh, like those hanging in museums made out of trash. So I collected all the trash for this and I started to be a sculptor when I decided to do this project. Um, and using trash for, and using materials to sculpt something instead of just depicting it in a 2D way for the first time led to some interesting discoveries because when we were installing this piece, as you can see in one of the pictures, there was this large door open and the skeleton would move because of the way it was put together, which is very interesting. But also before we pulled it up, it was hanging much lower and anyone who walked underneath it would smell what it was made of which added another sort of this like rotting whale corpse vibe to it, which wasn't intended. And most of the, nearly all of it was made out of recyclables. It wasn't a stinky sculpture, but the baleen, which is um, the filters that the whale, this is a minky whale skeleton. Um, the baleen I wanted to make out of cigarette butts. And that was something I decided from the get-go, I was gonna collect cigarette butts and I was gonna use them. The day before I was meant to collect the cigarette butts, it rained. Um, but the woman who worked at the art store uh, smoked in her art studio and would only use her art studio trash for cigarette butts and gave me them, all of them. So I had all of these cigarette butts, these, and they hadn't been outside, they hadn't been degraded. So if you stood underneath this whale, you smelled that. You were standing under these like disintegrating cigarette butts, and that added quite a bit to the piece. And another place where I learned about thinking of materials before you make your thing is um, when I was studying puppetry, which I did at the same time as sculpture. So making a puppet, 
I was taught, and it was emphasized again and again and again, think about what you want to do with your puppet. And because a puppet is something used in performance, thinking about what you want to do, what performance you want to give, that will dictate what you should make your puppet out of and what you should make your puppet look like. So I threw these in there because I will also be offering a puppet workshop. And these are just a few that I have thrown together. Um, and Reclining Market was also in the April Fish exhibit. But another place where I applied these same lessons that I was learning while using puppets was here. Uh, I made these eggs. And again, it was what I wanted the piece to do, what I wanted its performance to be, dictated what I used to make it. So for these eggs, which are these very delicate structures, I used um, cement, which is not a very delicate structure. Um, and I used it in a way that was also sort of reminiscent of the way like paper wasps or similar insects make their nests. So it's something that looks from far away, very natural, almost something that's insect-y with those like open spaces and the way it's thick around the openings and almost like mud. But when you get close, it's quite clearly cement. There's bits of plastic in there and it's in this nest of plastic. So it's a very interesting juxtaposition. And I also use found objects in my work. So this is a sculpture that I made for the purpose of reusing the vials that my testosterone comes in. So these are found object sculptures based around these testosterone bottles, I've also made these garlands, which you can see one of them is wearing. Um, and I have these garlands. And when I found when I was cleaning them out, that if you fill them with water, they catch the light in a very pleasing way. So then it's also another wearable sculpture. And it also has like a sound to it, which I have them here. They have a very loud sound to them. I'm not sure if you can hear it. Sometimes Zoom cancels it out. There's still water in a few. So there's that. And what I'm doing right now is this new project where I've taken uh, the concept of coming up th with things that I like to paint, things that I would like to do, um, that if I had a canvas, I would put them on a canvas, something that sort of thing. But um, so here you can see I've got the hands, I've got the leaves, for sure thing. But instead, specifically making the painting something that should be wearable. So this here I made for a shirt and I designed the painting I came up with this composition with the shirt in mind because I'd gotten some paint on this shirt and I was like let's see what happens um, but because this was successful and fun and a great project to do um, for my next one I decided to instead pretend that it wasn't a shirt and treat it like a sketchbook page and just sort of experiment on it and see what happens so now we've come full circle back to uh, another work inspired by the piece that was used to advertise this talk. Um, and this is entirely experimental. I know for a fact that when I wash it, the colors will change, but the black, the gold, and the parts with white will stay the same. So there will be something anchoring the image as it all gets mixed up. So I'm very excited to see what happens. And also it adds a bit of impermanence to my artwork which I usually don't delve into other than trash whale. Most of my art is made to survive. Um, so yeah, and also wearing this is an interesting experience because while I am wearing this shirt, if I wear this to a museum, then there is trans representation in artwork in the museum that I am wearing. And I did this. However, if I am doing this, I cannot see that. I can't access the representation. Anyone who is looking at me can. And then that also puts me on display. And it ended up being very referential to what it is like to be in a position where if you want representation, you have to make it. Because if you make it, then you are also putting yourself on display and you still don't get to see it. <laughs> but this is why it's important to continue to uplift all sorts of representation from various artists. So that is the end. Um, it was a bit long, sorry about that. But that is the end. <laughs> Ah, thank you so much, William. Um, I'm just going to read out some of the lovely comments in the chat before we get on to questions. Um, do you feel good? Yeah. It was absolutely amazing. Um, we've got such a powerful message behind your work. The fact that it was rejected, but then reinstated in the health clinic feels so important. And it's so sad that there is still such a negative reaction to work like this. Um, 
What else do we have? Um, I also think it's amazing that even though people have rejected your work and the ideas you explore, uh, you have continued to make the work you want. So inspirational to those exploring queer narratives. Uh, your titles are really effective in conveying the queer narratives. I feel they elevate the pieces in which itself is beautiful. And we've got one more at the bottom, which is your physical relationship to the ocean and the symbolic use of the ocean in your work is fascinating. Um, I personally have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, you talk a lot, well, I find it really interesting how you talk about breaking artwork and sort of making it queer and making it into something new um, and making work that looks broken as well. Um, I was wondering if you've got a particular artwork that you'd like to break. The artwork that I'd like to break, like yeah. of my own? <laughs> uh, of anyone's, oh, anything anyone. out there. Oh God, that's a hard question. <laughs> Um, artwork, I, I feel like it'd be mean to, to call it someone's art and say <laughs> I want to break it. Uh, artwork of my own that I would like to break though. Hmm. Oh, that's tough. God, that's such a hard question. <laughs> um, I didn't even think of it. Um, but I do, I do like broken artwork a lot. You're right. Um, hmm, artwork that I could break. Or think. is breaking something to that there's such a a line there between finding something that's already broken or physically breaking something or making is is that a it's line funny, that's too far to cross? Because a lot of the artwork that I have made is broken. It's broken on purpose. Like I don't even build it and break it. Like with those um, statuettes that looked broken. Like I just never made them whole. So I yeah. didn't. I didn't break something, I made something broken. I guess if I was going to break one of my own artworks, I keep, <laughs> so um, Daphne, Daphne coming out as asexual was a controversial piece because um, even though I conceded I was not going to make art about trans identity, um, this was still exploring queer identity. And I actually, was uh, reprimanded for using the color pink because that was considered putting gender into it after I had spent 20 minutes explaining that asexuality has nothing to do with gender. But I keep thinking of the fact that when I made that piece, um, no one would work with me to make it. So actually one of my friends um, who was not studying art at the time worked with me to create the piece. Um, they were another queer person and they helped me out. And as we were putting this piece together the night before it had to go in the museum on display, her head kept falling off. And so out of desperation, I started taking off, I took off my shirt and like a sock and putting things in there to hold her head in place as we could plaster around it. So I love um, Daphne and I would like to protect her. But I would, if you crack her open, you do get a free t-shirt. <laughs> That I that is wonderful, and you're sort of your your what's what's the term your um, not desperation, but your urgency to make work um, is is amazing. Um, I also wanted to ask about the galleries and the idea that galleries are broken because they reject so much queer art. Um, do you have any particular ways that you'd like to fix galleries or artist, uh, artistic institutions? I just think it needs to be made to the point where instead of it being abnormal for trans artwork to exist, it should be abnormal if every single depiction of a figure is cis. That, that we should get to a point where that's not how things are, or even if we're going to, because again, when we talk about art history institutions and those that don't include modern art, because some of them do, but if, if you're an art history institute and you don't want to include modern art, then that makes sense because it is art history, but to use more inclusive language, because when you label um, every male body is a cis male body and you're just using the word male, then that's not exactly great because people who go in there, whether they are, queer or there are trans or they 
are, but they don't know yet, or they might soon meet someone who is. And when you're reinforced again and again and again, this is the male body, this is the male body. It's just, it always reminds me of when I went to a Queering the Museum panel and they talked about how to queer their museum, they created a gallery of male nudes, of homoerotic male nudes to queer the museum because it was explicitly from a cisgender gay standpoint. And when I said, that's not queering the museum unless did you make it clear that those were cis bodies or were those just male nudes and what made them male? And it was like, oh, well, they had a penis, so they're male. And it's like, that's not it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think just, I'm not saying you have to put my artwork in your gallery, but you have to be aware and you have to make your space one that is more welcoming and you should put my artwork in your gallery. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to open up and see if anyone has questions in the audience. Oh, uh, Bethan got there first. Uh, Bethan? Hi, that was an amazing talk. I, I, like, I, love, I remember seeing your work the first time and just like loving it and hearing more about you and your journey, not just as an artist, but as a person. It's just so cool. And you know, I, I I look I look forward to when people get to watch this back on YouTube and like see you talking about your work so passionately. I just think it's great. Um, I obviously I know about your workshops, but could you just kind of talk briefly about the workshops you have planned for us so everyone does know what they're getting in for? Yes, so I have two workshops planned. So one of them, um, I talked about. I have this painting right here as a prop. So I talked about, <laughs> love using props. I talked about um, narcissists and that idea. So I'll be doing a Queering the Museum um, workshop where we will talk about that myth in particular and how it can be queered from a standpoint where instead of it being um, a vice of narcissism, it is the virtue of gender euphoria and just going through discussing the myth and how that works and then how that can be used in your own art and how we can make art in workshop. And then um, the other workshop I'm doing, so I did mention the puppets when I was talking about the use of materials. So I'll be doing an intro, um, intro level, very basic puppetry, um, how to make a puppet workshop in which we will learn how to and make a puppet together. My scarf um, that I'm wearing now is, a, is one of my puppets, Smurfit, um, who is designed to be Kermit's knockoff off-brand cousin. Um, and it can be seen in the uh, April Fish exhibit and also was in this presentation. So you can rewind and look at him again if you want. You're on mute. Okay, I'm on mute. <laughs> um, I'm always doing that. Uh, is there any more questions from the audience? Andrea? Yep, so hi, William. Thank you very much for the talk. It was amazing to hear about your work. And I liked your work beforehand, but now I'm absolutely in love with it to know the story behind your work. And I find it really interesting because it was uh, rejected, especially that she married her one. And I think it shows how important your role as an artist is in addressing queer uh, issues and how many challenges the queer community has every day. And I absolutely love your paintings. <laughs> I think there's very there's something very special about, about them. Um, in particular, the lines, they look like they have their own energy, but when they brought together, they like this whole, I don't know how to call it, <laughs> but it's something that's really seeing lots of emotions. And it, it was great to see your sculptures as well. Because even though the material you're using is, a, is very rigid and it's a hard material, I can still feel the same emotions that uh, your painting explode because of that gesture. I don't know how do you do that, but that's amazing. <laughs> so I don't really know what to ask you, but do you, uh, I've seen lots of paintings and I was wondering if you consider yourself more a painter than a sculpture of artist. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I consider myself. The reason so much of my work is paintings is because it's so much easier for me to just grab something and start painting than to um, get the materials to make a sculpture and then even more importantly to store the sculpture um, because I currently I live in a one room student dorm so 
like you can see even now, I tried to make this an aesthetically pleasing window, but if you look up, there's a puppet. And there's, if I make something, I have to store it somewhere and I can't wear all of them, um, which is another reason why I'm glad to be working on the shirts, but I, I just need to keep making art. So it is something that I will continue to do. And um, just the other day, I was considering making a sculpture because I saw this um, vessel in the museum that I really liked. And I was like, oh, I'd like to make that. So I, I don't know, I, I can't say that I am, perhaps I am more often a painter, but even when I paint, I'm using aspects and things that I learned when making sculptures. So it's all just kind of rolled into one big thing. Thank you. And we've got a question from Camilla. Hi, William. Hi. I just wanted to say, um, you, your delivery of your whole presentation was just like so captivating. I was like 100% listening the whole time. Um, I've got a question. Out of all the ways you can try and um, tackle like this narrative about queer representation, why do you choose to do it through myths? I think that is because of the way in which I grew up and particularly because of my mom. Um, my mom uh, got her master's in art history while I was, I was growing up. Um, and so she would take me to museums all the time. And even when, when she was studying, I would hear a lot about the myths she was studying. I remember when we had the, these picture books in the house that we would all read as kids, one of them was about like mythological creatures that pop up in like Roman, or not Roman, in Roman artwork, but also there was like the medieval tapestries, those creatures as well. Um, so I was exposed to art through myths over and over again. And I still remember when I was studying art in um, Rome and I came across Bernini's Daphne and Apollo, I had a distinct memory of my mother explaining that myth to me when I was much younger and she was studying our history. So these are things that are familiar to me. And when I go into a museum, I can recognize these stories from these myths. And there is that sort of, when we go to see art, I think there is this natural um, desire to see ourselves represented in it somewhere, whether it's in the story or it's in the pieces, but to see like, oh, that one looks like you, or to point to the ugliest creature you can find and tell your sibling, that one looks like you. But we're always looking for ourselves in artwork. And if you can't see it in the figures, then you're looking for it in the stories. And if you can't see it there either, then you're just looking for something that you can recognize. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, myths and stories um, are, are something that I keep going to. I have, I have nothing to say for why Ophelia or why Hamlet was such a big thing, other than the fact that in high school, when I was reading it, my final year of high school, I took a class where we read it. At the same time as I was reading it, um, several of my friends were in a production of it where the roles switched each night. So to see each of my friends, I ended up seeing the play several times. So I think I latched on to some of that. That's the only reason I can think of for, for continuing to work with that, when as the other myths are things that I see more often in art. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, William, for such an amazing talk. Um, is there any last questions? Oh, Bethan? Sorry, I have a last one. Um, yeah, so obviously you've had a lot of like negativity towards some of the themes that you've explored, like the queer narratives in your work. Do you ever think that the work you make could change someone's view of queer people? Is that a possibility, do you think? Um, yeah, I actually forgot to say this. I can't believe that I've seen so many things. But the painting Renaissance, um, I painted it um, in the last, the last month where I was still home before I moved to this lovely one or student dorm. And um, before I left, I showed it to my grandparents. And at the time, they it's not that they weren't supportive, it was more that they didn't understand. There was this time where I was figuring out my gender and they weren't quite sure where, where, I'd, where I'd stopped. Um, but it was in front of that piece. So it was the three of us um, standing in front of that artwork where they did understand it. And they said to me like, oh, okay, like you're, you're a man, we get this now. Um, so I know for a fact that it can, because these are two very old, and one of them is incredibly Catholic, people who stood in front of this six foot painting and 
recognize that they were also sharing the room with their grandson. And so that kind of makes me a bit, I'm glad the painting is there. I'm so glad it exists, but it's also in my garage and it provided that moment for me. And I would like for it to do that for other people as well, if I could ever have the chance to, to give it a platform. So it's another reason why I'm very appreciative uh, for being involved in Round Lemon because I'm getting to do this talk and I'm, I get to do the interview and my artwork is in the art shop. And so I am sort of getting that platform and I can only hope that maybe it will affect someone in some way. Oh, that's amazing. And we love that you're part of our Round Lemon community. I think you're a great addition to the Round Lemon team. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely. Um, just, I'm in awe of your work and how powerful it is and how assertive you are when talking about it and how confident it's it's just wonderful to see um i think we're going to wrap it up there if there's no extra questions um so we have artist talks every thursday at seven o'clock uh, you can get tickets for free on the round lemon website it's um at, at the art shop actually no zest shop so roundlemon.co.uk slash zest shop, zest shop. Um, we also have the open mic night coming up in a couple of weeks time for June. Tickets are free for that as well. We have Williams workshops coming up as well. The link for them is all in the description. Um, Williams links for social media is also there as well. And with that, I will say thank you to William and thank you for everyone else for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Oh, lot.